Good morning, brothers. Good morning, sisters. It's awesome to be here and get the chance to worship with you this morning. It is only because of Jesus Christ that we can be here, and it is only because of Jesus Christ that we can do this. And so this morning, let us fix our eyes and our hearts and our minds solely on him. Let's stand together and sing his praises. name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all Ye chosen seed, ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord. Good morning and welcome. Uh, if you're new here, if you're visiting with us, if you're our guest, we want to say thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, if you need anything at all, we would encourage you to uh, speak with one of our ushers in the back and they would be happy to assist you. Uh, we have a few announcements for you. I've got a couple people that are going to come up and share with you. Danielle and uh, Paul Schmid. Uh, you guys can come on up right now. Uh, Danielle is our children's ministry director uh, and Paul is the chair of our missions committee. Uh, so I'm going to let them, uh, they've both got, each have an announcement for you. Good morning. Um, I've just come to make an announcement about a new program that we're starting here at the Bible Church. We're going to be having a weekly play group um, during the day on Wednesdays from 9.30 to 11. Um, we're basically doing like a open gym type thing. So if you have young kids at home during the day, we'd love for you to come and just have some fellowship with other parents and some playtime for your kids we do have a little bit of um, activities for a portion of that time, so it's not all just run around the gym like crazy. So um, you can expect some um, songs and some crafts and story time. So we'd love to see you, and if you have grandkids, um, invite them over on Wednesday so you can bring them to play group, and um, we hope that you'll just enjoy this time with us. Good morning. Uh, as he said, I'm Paul Schmidt. Uh, this picture on the screen is uh, Cassio is his name. Uh, many of you that have been to the Copper Island camp in British Columbia have met Cassio. Cassio is a First Nations. He's probably 20-ish. Um, and he, 
as a, a child, came to the camp multiple times as a camper, and five or six years ago, uh, accepted Christ as his Savior through the ministry of the camp there. And um, this is this past year we were at camp. He actually joined our team as one of the counselors and led a cabin of his own, which was really exciting to me because the ultimate goal of cross-cultural missions is to have enough new believers to reach their own people. So it's really, really exciting to me to see that happen in a very small way. But as an, the unreached people group that they are, until that happens in a much more significant way, Cassio is not going to be doing it by himself, so we're taking a team back to Copper Island this coming year. Um, and the Copper Island mission is something that this church has been very, very faithful to, and that's something that, as a church, we do and should take pride in, but it's also a challenge because that faithfulness does not happen by default. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens by people who are challenged by the Spirit to get involved in the commandment that we have to take the gospel to those who don't know. And it's a commandment that we should all be involved in in some way in our lives, whether it's Copper Island, whether it's elsewhere um, in our community or in the world. So Natalia and I have gone, I think this will be the fifth year to Copper Island, I'm not sure. And it seems like every year it's harder and harder for us to fill the team to Copper Island. Um, especially with young people, there's a lot of loyal people and this year there's going to be less of those that loyal segment of team that is going to be able to go for whatever reason so I would just ask each of you to search your hearts pray uh, and ask the spirit if it's something that he would be calling you to be involved in in the next couple weeks there's going to be more information coming out about how you can get involved for now I'd just like you to pray about it thank you Thanks. Uh, and on that note of missions, I've got one final announcement. Some of you know, some of you have received letters in the mail. Uh, we're taking a group to Mexico, uh, and that is in March. It's a, just, uh, just over a month away, uh, the 17th through the 25th of March. Uh, it's about half high school kids uh, and half adults. There's going to be nine of us from the church that go. Uh, and first, I want to thank you, uh, all of you who have supported and given letters and things like that. We are greatly uh, appreciative of that. Uh, but I also want to invite you out next Sunday following the worship service. We're going to have a taco bar here at the church, a free taco bar. You can come and make your own tacos uh, and hear a little bit about the trip uh, that we'll be having. It's completely free. You don't have to give anything. Uh, we will accept donations if you want to give, uh, but you don't have to. Uh, the biggest thing is we want to let you know what's happening, what we're going to be doing, uh, and give you some ways you can be praying for us as we go. We'll have a, a resource or two to give to you that you can take home, uh, things to be praying for and things to be thinking about. Um, it's the same place. We, we took a team in 2015, uh, and we're going back to the same place, working with the same missionaries. Uh, so we are very, very grateful for your support, uh, and we would invite you to stay next Sunday for lunch with us. Thank you. Thinking about missions, Lord willing, next Sunday morning I will be preaching in Medellin, Colombia uh, at a church that Doug and Cindy Tankersley are involved with. Uh, we will, Connie and I will, Lord willing, be flying out Wednesday. Uh, we will take a little bit of a look at the city and then a team is flying in on Saturday. We'll join in some of their training. Uh, we're going to visit the seminary uh, that Doug and Cindy are a part of. Uh, we're going to, again, go to a worship service. I'll preach, and then Monday we will spend the day with the team and uh, going door-to-door, -door, as Doug and Cindy do, down in Medellin. And so we very much covet your prayers. Um, people have asked me, the people that know we're going, are you excited about the trip? And I must honestly tell you, if I'm candid, is, is to a degree I'm not. Now let me give you the reasons why. It's inconvenient. Uh, I have a lot to do. Uh, every week presents more things to do and to take a chunk out of uh, uh, my week and time like this inconvenience uh, me. It is a degree of risk. Uh, probably not many more people other than maybe Eric Johnson read more, think more, look more about airplanes than I do. And uh, having done that, I know too much. And so I know flying is risky. Flying is uncomfortable. I don't enjoy it anymore. Commercial flying, I, to be honest, I hate. 
Uh, I worry about illness, having gotten sick on the mission field before. Uh, I know that that's difficult to deal with, plus it's um, aggravating because you're not being able to do what you've been sent to do. I worry about saying something stupid. <laughs> you know, you're up there, you're speaking through a translator, and you worry about, oh, I just said that, and they're all going, oh, 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 oh. And I'm getting to the point to where Ford County is an awful pleasant place to be. But having said all that, I believe it will be a blessing to Doug and Cindy for you to send us there to know Gibson City Bible Church loves us, cares about us, and Paul and Connie are here to communicate it. I know it will be a blessing to the people to whom we will be uh, ministering. Uh, other trips, every time I've gone and gone to meet with Believers on uh, site, they always are amazed that people here care enough about them there that they would come there. So I go representing you, and when I stand up next Sunday, that's exactly what I will say. And I go because I believe it expands my vision, and by expanding my vision, I think it also expands our vision as a church. So having said all of that, there's no reason why you shouldn't go to Copper Island. If you have not been on a short-term mission trip, you need to go. Copper Island is an easy trip. Four-hour flight, direct, you don't have to change planes. You get a, the, the, the setting is breathtaking. When I say it's amazing, you're speaking English, you got clean water, good food, fresh salmon, Easy place to serve in a lot of ways and the opportunity to introduce the gospel to children that have never perhaps heard the gospel. So prayerfully consider going to Copper Island. If not Copper Island, then think about other short-term trips of which you might be a part. It is a glorious, wonderful privilege to be able to participate in those trips. Uh, as you pray, <coughs> many of you know by now, uh, Bruce uh, and Stephanie Callell and their family attend the church here. Uh, Bruce's father passed away uh, yesterday morning. The arrangements are pending, but it looks like, and this is tentative, but it looks like uh, their, uh, Ed is from the, I, I call it Jerseyville, is it right? Jerseyville area. The funeral and visitation will be there, but they're going to have a visitation here in our church, and that is tentative, <laughs> sorry, <coughs> tentatively planned for Thursday evening. That's not for sure yet, but tentatively planned for Thursday evening here in our building. If you're not on our email contact list, you ought to be, because a lot of that information will be disseminated through that avenue. So take the tear off on your bulletin if we don't have your email and uh, give it to us if you don't mind. And you can always check. Uh, we do put some information out via uh, Facebook as well. Uh, let's pray, please. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your grace and your mercies and the opportunities that you give us, the opportunities to live in such a way that it evidences the fact that we have encountered the living Christ and he's changed our life and the people that we work with and the people that we live with and the people that we're friends with are able to encounter the gospel as we live lives loving Jesus. Thank you for the opportunities we have to disseminate that gospel around the world and that you've placed us in this place and you've provided the means whereby we can go to places like Columbia and Copper Island and participate in your kingdom work in a significant way and be used of you. And we have that delight, the pleasure, the joy of doing that. We're grateful. Help us to always be passionate about the gospel. We pray for Bruce and Stephanie and their children and Bruce's family and ask that you would comfort, give grace. May you encourage them, help us as the body of Christ to be a source of comfort and grace to them. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the hope beyond the grave. Thank you for the hope 
that is found in Jesus. We rejoice in that great hope on this great and glorious day because we know this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This next song we introduced a couple weeks ago. So um, when we get to this first chorus, if you were here and you remember how the song goes, I just want to ask you to sing out with confidence um, for the benefit of your brothers and sisters who weren't here um, so that so they can enter in boldly and with confidence as they're learning this song. It's a privilege to be able to worship Jesus with you. Let's take the kind of passion that our beloved Jesus deserves. Bring that passion to bear on our worship of him. You were the word in the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you are Christ Sing it out What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What can separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Well, death could not hold you. The veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. My King, what a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is, 
nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Crown him. Crown him with many crowns. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days but he was speaking about the temple of his body when therefore he was raised from the dead his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken the ushers would come forward and pray for the offering Father God thank you so much for this day <clears throat> thank you for this, the beautiful weather you've given us um, that we can enjoy your creation that we can see the birds and um, just the signs of new life and spring around the corner. Um, Father, we just ask that you would help us see those blessings for what they are, see that every breath that you give us is um, undeserved and that um, we don't own any, anything. Um, in fact, Lord, we pray now that you would bless this offering that we give back to you um, and that uh, you would use it to further your kingdom. You would use it to grow our trust in you, uh, and and that you would just be with us now as we uh, continue worship, that your spirit would move, and uh, and and just change our hearts. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, Amen. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him One final breath he gave As heaven looked away The Son of God was laid in darkness A battle in the grave The war on death was waged The power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, he 
His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? A resurrected King has rendered you defeated forever. He is glorified forever. He is lifted high forever. He is risen. He is alive. He is alive. The ground began to shake. The storm was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? A resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. amazing accounts in scripture of the saints gathered around the throne singing praises singing hallelujah to the lamb who has overcome let's stand right now if you're able as we sing may our worship in this moment be a foretaste of that experience sing with us we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah. the throne there came a voice saying praise to our God all you his servants and all who fear him small and great and then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty thunder peals crying out hallelujah for the Lord our God the Almighty Rains. Sing praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
praise Christ who died and rose on high. Who is that we no more may die? Now seated on the judgment throne, all praise to you <laughs> tell me your name My Joshua. Joshua wow you've played the sax before <laughs> that was awesome thank you for uh, thank you for joining us up here today I think these are on and I absolutely want them off. I don't know who's in charge of those, but I know. I don't know who has the thing, but whoever has the thing, please make sure those are off. I appreciate that. If you look at this, um, wow, I am loud. I, I can't help it. I'm just talking, so I, I have no control over it. Is this better? Okay. If you look at this map, you see these red dots, these red blocks. Uh, these represent people, and I would submit to you that the people that these blocks or dots represent are right. R-I-G-H-T. They are correct. Here is how they are correct. There are three meals during the day. There's breakfast. There is dinner at noon, and in the evening, there is supper. Those are the three meals of the day. And these blocks represent concentrations of people that understand the reality of that. <laughs> that there are these three meals, breakfast, dinner at noon, and 
Supper. Supper speaks of family and friends and being together in the evening and talking and sharing. It comes from the French word actually super, and it's S O U P E R. It is biblical, is it not? We partake of the Lord's never dinner, the Lord's supper. It is a biblical concept. It is a biblical word. We'll look in the book of Revelation, chapter number 19. We're going to talk about a supper to which you are invited. And I would urge you that you need to go to this particular supper because of its host because of its location, because of its significance. This is absolutely an invitation that you will want to accept. As we look at the book of Revelation, the end is quickly approaching. We're in chapter 19 of 22. I commend you for enduring. Uh, Those of you who have um, the message of the book, don't give up. Stay faithful. Don't give up hope. Uh, Don't Compromise, written as a letter to these seven churches, written apocalyptically. That's why it has all these strange images and ideas. And yes, written prophetically as it describes events yet to come. But as it's written, it is written seeking to pull the veil back just a little bit so that we can have God's perspective on the world in which we live, God's perspective on the time in which we live. As we look at the immediate context of chapter number 19, we have just come through fallen, fallen Babylon the Great. Uh, Babylon representing, I believe, the system of uh, the world that is in a state of rebellion against the rule of God. It is that world system that's in place. We talked about the three principles. We talked about the pleasure of Babylon, the power of Babylon and the prosperity of Babylon, and we saw how they've turned all those things on its head from their original intent because Babylon has become an idolater, and how we as the salt of the earth and the light of the world need to take those three truths and demonstrate how God himself wants those things to find balance and reality in our lives. But Babylon This system that is in rebellion against God is going to be overthrown and how there is joy and rejoicing over that. And we also have talked about having a worldview that (coughs) is biblically based so that we can understand how we are to function in the world in which we live. But in chapter number 19, we're going to talk about being invited to supper, and I want to give you my three points, and then I'll put them up on the slides, uh, on the screens so you can see them. Here are the three points. I'm not trying to be silly with them, even though it may sound like it initially. Number one will be the beginning of the ending, but don't panic. First principle out of Revelation 19 is the beginning of the ending, but we shouldn't panic. The second principle is the ending of the beginning. So it's the beginning of the ending, and then we move into this ending of the beginning, and we should rejoice. And then the one that's a little harder, the ending beginning, the ending beginning, and the beginning ending. The ending beginning and the beginning ending, we should do the work. And I'll explain all those as we go through it, I hope. The beginning of the ending, we should not panic. Revelation 19. Then I heard, verse 1, Then I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true, which judgments He's just demonstrated. For He has judged the great prostitute, that is Babylon, who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of His servants, those that Babylon put to death because of their faith. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders, whom we've already met in the book, and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, saying, 
Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you servants, all you who fear him, small and great. Verse number six, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, for the, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen of the right, is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at the angel's feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We'll stop there, then we will move further as we go. The beginning of the ending. I don't know how many of you watched the Super Bowl, but if you went to bed at halftime, obviously you went to bed too soon. Uh, sometimes Super Bowl games can be pretty bland, pretty boring. This one turned out to be very exciting. Uh, and the second half turned out to be pretty exciting. Unless you're, I was pulling for Atlanta. I'd, I was hoping that uh, Atlanta would win. Uh, but uh, as you watch the game, you, you, the second half, you saw it begin to unfold. You heard the announcers say, look, this is going to be the first time in the history of the Super Bowl, it looks like, that we're going to go into overtime. And when we went into overtime, it is the beginning of a new game. You know, really, you're starting fresh. It's the beginning of the ending, though, because this thing is going to end during this overtime period. And so this chapter number 19, I believe, marks the beginning of the ending. Some folks would say, as we look at history, as we see history unfolding, they say, don't worry, we've seen this kind of thing before, we've been here before, uh, it's, things will have a way of working uh, themselves out. Uh, parents sometimes say to their children, who now have children, don't panic, uh, been there before, it'll work out, be all right, don't worry about it. And we can kind of look at history rather than as linear, having a starting point and a concluding point, we can think of history as circular. It starts and it goes around and it just goes around and it goes around and it goes around. And so there's this cyclical motion to history. Nations rise up, nations are put down, kings rise up, kings go down, presidents come, presidents go. Life continues on in this circular pattern. But I'm submitting to you that there is an ending to history as we know it. And what I'm submitting to you, that is, you look at the, the scriptures, you look at the story of the Bible, it indicates to us that there is an ending, a conclusion, a crescendo, when all that we know uh, shall come to its point of finality. So there is an end, even when there doesn't seem to be one, there is a conclusion that comes. Bartholomew and Goheem in a book entitled, and I recommend it, Drama of Scriptures, entitled The Drama of Scripture. They write this, To be human means to embrace some basic story through which we understand our world and chart our course through it. Babylon understood a, the world through its basic story of humanity. Here's a basic story. Life is about getting all that you can get out, squeezing all you can squeeze out of it, every bit of pleasure, every bit of de fulfill, every desire. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you die. When you die, you go into the grave. The lights go out. The music stops. The ground grows cold. All that you know has now come to a, its conclusion. So if that's the case, here's the story you live by. You live by the story of seeking to fulfill whatever hunger or desire 
or pleasure you may have. Don't let anyone hold you back. Don't let any circumstance inhibit you. You drink as much of that cup as you possibly can. That is a story. And people live their lives, while not consciously perhaps, they live their lives by that story. And the Bible comes and it has a story. And that story is to shape us and to conform us. And I want to give you the basic chapters of that story. Uh, there are four of them, and let me just tick down through them. One, there is the chapter on creation. The Lord God has made them all. All things bright and beautiful, all things great and small, the Lord God, he has made them all. Little bitty crickets, St. Bernard dogs, uh, forsythia bushes. I'm so excited. Uh, my forsythia is starting to look prime for springtime, and I know from Mr. Dean Summers, when my forsythia blooms, that's when I put my stuff on my yard. My, my medicine for my yard goes on when the yellow blooms come. From the forsythias up to the great giant redwoods, from uh, the, uh, the uh, creatures in the sea to the birds of the air, God is the starter, God is the originator, God is the thought, God is the word. From human beings who are made in his image, the Lord God has made them all. We are not simply uh, globs of, uh, of uh, genes and blood and inside stuff and outside stuff. The Lord has made us even in his own image, though that image is marred by the fall. The truth is, the story of the Bible is God created us. Secondly, the second piece is rebellion Eugene Peterson writes, a catastrophe has occurred. We're no longer in continuity with our good beginning. We have been separated from our good beginning by a disaster. We are also, of course, separated from our good end by the same disaster. We are, in other words, in the middle of a mess, right? We're in the middle of a mess. We see it. We know it. We hear it on the news. We see it happening. There are our own personal experiences. Uh, there's a, we, we, we make our way through this earth. There are so many pleasures that, that even the follow of Christ, uh, even more so the follow of Christ, can experience and know, but yet there's so much heartache. There's death, and there's disease, and there's uh, discouragement, and there's sin, and there's fallenness, and it's all around us. It's everywhere. Man exists in this state of rebellion, and he exhibits it with his guilt, his fear, his shame, his hiding from God. Redemption, a rebellion, did not mean we were no longer human, but explains how we function as humans, excuse me, and we're in a state of rebellion, and God, motivated by his great love for us, has sought to redeem us, to provide a way of escape from the just justice, forgive the um, redundancy, the just justice that God himself must demonstrate. But he's provided a way out, a way to escape that. Fourthly, there's this consummation. The story comes to its conclusion. God is salvaging his creation. All of the earth groans. All the earth moans. Romans 8, longing for that day of being set free from the curse God is going to redeem and, and rid it of the vestiges of sin, defeated the powers of evil on the cross, thrown open the door of new creation and resurrection, and now we are invited to participate in both the now and the not yet of the coming and having come kingdom of God. There's this great and glorious consummation. I'll look forward to that. And so the book of Revelation, and as we come to chapter number 19, is the beginning of that consummation. There is an end. Life just doesn't keep. I used to have a card that dieseled. You ever had a card that dieseled? It wasn't a diesel. It was a gas engine, but it dieseled when I turned it off. That's what they told me it did. I didn't know what it was doing. I was ignorant about those things, but when I would shut it off, it would go, it would just keep and going like that and going like that. It was kind of cool, actually, for me. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I was sure the girls were impressed, you know. 
and the world just doesn't keep dieseling along, firing off, you know, just kind of, there's a, there's a crescendo, there's a point in time in history that the world as we now know it will come to its completed point. That's the point of Revelation, and that's the point where we have now reached. Time is linear. It is moving forward. That makes us ask the question, the same question that's been asked during the history of the church, has the beginning begun? Is this it? Has this started? Is, is the Antichrist alive? Does the mark of the beast have to do with computers and the Internet? Uh, you know, or are we seeing the beginning of one world government? I don't know. I don't know. James 5.8 says this, Be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. So what I do know is that we live with this sense of imminence, which means the Lord could come at any time. Well, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, we do live with this confidence that the Lord himself will return with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. We know that the Lord is going to come, and so the Scripture exhorts us that while we may not know and may not be aware of, and I will be honest, I think it's safer that way, that we don't know, the Lord in his wisdom has not told us, all these things, we do and should be motivated to live in such a way that the beginning of the end is here upon us. The Lord can come. And in the book of Revelation, chapter number 19, marks that ending beginning because of where it's located. Obviously, there's this sense of sequence, although John uses this dramatic writing where he goes back, picks up something, moves forward, goes back, picks up something, moves forward, goes back, and he repeats it, and he looks at it from different angles. But all the while, this revelation that he has is moving forward, is moving forward, is moving forward. And this chapter marks this beginning of the ending. And John celebrates it. What word? Here's a good Bible trivia question. This, you could win. Here it is. What word occurs in chapter number 19 of the book of Revelation that does not occur in any other place in the New Testament? Do not. <laughs> I saw you. What word? Don't count. Shout it out. We just have sung it. Hallelujah. The only place in the New Testament the word occurs, and it occurs four times in the book of chapter, or Revelation chapter 19. And we come to that great and glorious hallelujah course. If you go see Handel's Messiah, you come to that point. It's not the end of the Messiah. Some people think, well, that's the, it's over with. No, no, no. But you come to that great and glorious place. Everybody stands, and we hear that it's sung. The hallelujah, praise to Yahweh. Praise be given to Yahweh. Praise to Yahweh. It is a signal. John is signaling us as he pulls that out of the Old Testament, especially the Psalms that were sung during the Lord's Supper, the Passover, the Psalms that Jesus sang. And it is rampant. It is full of these words, hallelujah. And it's song, sung in celebration of the Lord's deliverance. And I think John these things are in the Scripture for a reason. Is signaling the Lord God Almighty reigns. It is time to celebrate and rejoice and praise Him because the ending of the beginning has, or the beginning of the ending has begun. It is here upon us. Praise Him. John is saying to us, and we should not panic. We shouldn't be afraid. I want to do a series of sermons. i got this series percolating in my back of my head because I've said it several times, but now I want to preach a series of sermons on Christian confidence. We've got to have confidence, confidence in the Lord, confidence in the Scripture, confidence in the power of the Holy Spirit, confidence in God's grace, confidence in the, one another. We've got to have confidence. Don't panic. Don't be afraid. Our culture is shot through with fear. You know, uh, North Korea launched a, uh, a ballistic missile yesterday. We're afraid uh, of what uh, that strange young uh, man who's in charge of North Korea could do. Who knows what? We're afraid of all kinds of things. Don't panic. Don't panic. Praise God. The beginning 
of the end. The second thing that John writes about is the ending of the beginning. Winston Churchill, 1942, said, Now is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. That was when they had just beat Rommel in Egypt in 1942. This marks the ending of the beginning because things now move so quickly. And John is given this glorious metaphor, this imagery to use for uh, the coming of the Lord and this supper to which we are invited. And the metaphor or the image that he uses is that of a, not a supper, uh, well, a supper, but a, a wedding, a wedding. How many of you have ever been to a wedding? <laughs> I've been to one, two, three. Well, he uses this imagery uh, verse 7, let us rejoice and exult and give God the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with pure, pure uh, fine linen, bright and pure. The wedding, the imagery is of a wedding. Let's think about that for just a little bit and then make some applications. Number one, John uses this classic and when you, begin to, when you begin to read through the chapter and meditate on it, you begin to see all these connections. There are all these connections. The Bible is not written in such a way. There's all these, these sinews and synapse and, 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 and wires that connect all these imagery uh, to one another. And he talks about this, this marriage. It begins in Jewish uh, marriage. It begins... Uh, you know, in this classical uh, Jewish marriage, it begins with a betrothal where the pr pr prospective groom and best man comes to the father of the bride's house and says, how much? <laughs> how much is your daughter worth? Hmm. Maybe you would say, hey, dude, I'll pay you to take her. <laughs> no. no, you would never say that. How much? Let's, es let's establish a purchase price. For you were bought with a price. And at that point of establishing that purchase price, they are legally husband and wife, though they are not practically husband and wife. The marriage is not consummated, but there are only two ways to get out of a marriage once you are engaged. or with they, The scripture classic wouldn't use that kind of terminology. They'd use betrothal. What are the two ways you get out of it? Divorce, death. That's it. Once you are betrothed, once you have established that you're going to marry this young woman, then you go through this preparation period. You're betrothed, and then, a, and then there were no hard and fast rules, but you'd go back and you'd begin to prepare, begin to think about the wedding, begin to establish yourself in your occupation, get all ready that you're about to be married. And typically, but not always, it'd be about a year, 12 months, waiting, getting ready. And then there comes the wedding and the supper. And the bride would not know exactly on what day, though she may have some idea of around what day, that the groom and his wedding party is coming for her, and they would all come. Behold the what? The bridegroom cometh. And the bridegroom shows up, and he says, Come home with me. And so he gathers his beautiful bride and her wedding entourage and they go marching and everybody's celebrating as they go through the streets and they come back to the groom's house and for 7 to 14 days they party and celebrate and eat and drink and dance 7 to 14 days that's why at the wedding in Cana he said you know usually they serve the bad wine last because by then who cares but you've served the best wine last I go in John 14 I go to 
prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and do what? Receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. All of that imagery is found right here in this text as God says, I've bought you with a price. I betrothed you to myself. There's a period of preparation and waiting, but now I'm coming back, and when I come back, behold, the bridegroom cometh, so I can receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. And that imagery fills the Scriptures. In the Old Testament, over and over, about the imagery of God and His wife, Israel, how He has bought her, how He laments over her as He tells this guy to go marry this woman. She is a woman uh, Gomer, who is not faithful, but she represents the infidelities of, of Israel and how it breaks God's heart. His wife has betrayed him, and on and on it goes. John 3, 39, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, says, I am the friend of the bridegroom. I'm not the bridegroom. I'm the friend. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present her to himself, the church, in all of his glory. All of that language comes out of this idea of marriage. Second Corinthians 11, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to a husband, that to Christ I might present you, as a pure virgin, talking to the body of Christ. Betrothal, preparation, and then celebration or consummation. Now, I will confess that men, to some degree or other, get a little uncomfortable with that imagery. When you start telling men you're a bride, men kind of go, hey, And when we start, Joseph, I, I, didn't, I didn't call him this. Joseph calls him this. Jesus is my boyfriend songs. He said there are a lot of songs out there where Jesus is my boyfriend. We try to stay away from those songs. And, and men, we sing those, and men feel uncomfortable about grabbing Jesus and pulling Jesus to themselves and, and hugging on him. And we're like, I get a little uncomfortable with some of that. If we're honest... But man, when we come to this text and all this glorious imagery is used, it is about Christ and its corporate relationship with the body, that is, the whole body of Christ. It's not about an individual thing. It's about Jesus and his love for this corporate group of individuals, the body. And it is an expression used to express love and covenant and commitment and relationship, and it is used in this particular chapter to contrast with the infidelity, immorality, and impurity of Babylon, who is not a bride, but is a prostitute, and has rebelled against God himself. But he says the, 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 the ending of the beginning is here, so we should rejoice. Third thing. The ending beginning and the beginning ending. <laughs> the ending beginning. So this beginning is ending, and there's a beginning that is ending, and there's a beginning that is beginning. <laughs> In other words, there's a transition that's going to happen, and, and we begin to move into eternity, and when you read Revelation chapter number 19, there are two suppers. There's the supper of the Lamb. And what an exciting supper that's been. You know, I don't understand the resurrection body and all that's involved in it. I believe we'll eat. Jesus ate after the resurrection, didn't he? I don't know what we're going to eat. It's going to be good. I don't know what we're going to drink. It's going to be good. I don't understand how digestion works in the resurrection body, but it's going to happen. We're going to eat. So we're going to sit down together, eat at this glorious supper. You say, well, that's just imagery. Okay, okay, I get that. I get that. I get that. But I still think we're going to eat. And there's this other supper. There's a marriage supper of the Lamb. And then there's this other one. 
Verse 17. I saw an angel standing in the sun. That's an amazing image. And a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings and of captains and of mighty men and horses and riders and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. This is the mighty supper of God. There is a supper that is also coming in which God's judgment, and we're going to see that now, we're at the end, Judge, God's judgment breaks, and for those who are not at the marriage supper of the Lamb, those who are not allowed to put their feet on the table, like Mephibosheth put his feet under David's table. Remember Mephibosheth? And he was scared to death. David was going to kill him, destroy him. And he says, no, no, you're invited to put your feet under my table. You're Mephibosheth, you're invited. You're welcome. For those who are welcome to come and, and receive that invitation and accept that invitation, they will be allowed by God's grace to have uh, entrance into the marriage supper of the Lamb. They belong there. They're supposed to be there. They should be there. They've got the garment on. They're eating the king's food. They're allowed. But those who reject him, those who refuse him, those who choose against him, those who are apathetic toward him, those that don't want to go his way, those that don't want to accept his lordship, those that don't want to love him and follow him and seek him, there's also a supper. But in this supper, they themselves become the main course as God himself judges. And when we think about that supper, then it is imperative on us that we must work. That's why we go to Copper Island. Boys and girls, you're invited to supper. You're invited to the, have G, supper with Jesus. <laughs> We're inviting you to come have supper with Jesus. My mom and dad, I, God bless my mom. She was a... Uh, my mom could just peel the paint off of a, but she could also be one of the most gracious. Everybody knew, everybody around Melder, Louisiana knew that you could come to our house in the evening. You did not call. If she resented that, you did not call. You did not ask. You just showed up, and she was going to feed you. That was her joy. You didn't, you didn't call and say, hey, Ray, can I come have some? No, that would offend her because she wanted you to know you don't have to call me because my invitation is always standing. And so is Jesus. Come and dine. The master calleth, come and dine. You're invited to have supper with Jesus. But if you do not, you're going to be part of the supper of the judgment of God. And we go to Copper Island, we say to those little children, children, you're invited to have supper with Jesus. We go to Columbia, and we say to those folks, you're invited to have supper with Jesus. We go to uh, Champagne, and we go to uh, Muhammad, and we go to Fisher, and Sibley, and Melvin, and all those places around, and we invite people to come to experience this glorious supper of the Lamb. You're invited, you're invited, you're invited to come and have supper with Jesus. Here's the question. Would anybody miss us if we were gone? If, if our church got swallowed, if all of us sitting in here, I don't just think about the building, I think of church, I think of you. If we disappeared, would we be missed? By other than, you know, our family. Would Gibson City miss us? Would Fusa miss us? Would Champagne miss us? I, I submit they would. I think they'd miss us greatly. They'd miss the, uh, the, the, the ministry that we have of shining the light because there is hope. And uh, we are invited. Don't you love this image? We are invited. We are invited to come and have dinner with Jesus. You're inviting people. You're inviting people into fellowship and warmth. I can remember those folks as a kid coming to my mom and dad's house. And mom would get the supper out. She always had food. I don't know how she did. She always had food. She warmed that food up. Didn't Microwaves didn't exist at that time. My mom would have hated a microwave, even though she ended up getting one. I don't ever remember 
her cooking in that thing, but she would turn the oven on, gas only, thank you very much. She'd turn that oven on, and you would sit and visit, and she'd bring out that chicken, or perhaps she would have some frozen fish. She'd thaw that out and fry it, or she'd have some frozen. She always had a pot of gumbo, squirrel gumbo or guinea gumbo. She'd thaw that out. She'd cook it, and we'd sit down at that table. We'd, it'd be fun. It'd be enjoyable. It'd be warm. It'd be glorious. It'd be comfortable. Jesus says, come and dine. Come and eat. Come and eat with me. I'm inviting you. I want you to. He extends that invitation, and there's one way that invitation gets out. There's one way. That's when Robin gives it out, and Carrie gives it out, and Eric gives it out, and Joan gives it out, and Steve gives it out, and Gideon gives it out. It's when we give out the invitation. Come and dine. The Master's calling. Come and dine. Come have supper with Jesus. Let's pray, please. Would you stand with me? Our Heavenly Father, one great and glorious day, an invitation arrived in our lives to come and know Jesus and to love Him and enter into a relationship with Him. And many of us have, by Your grace and through Your mercy, accepted that invitation. And we're looking forward to finally seeing You face to face and, we'll, and sitting down at a table with people from every tribe and tongue and nation and color and rejoicing and singing and eating and laughing and expressing gratitude to the Lamb of God who sits upon the throne. But there are folks who don't know Jesus, and we pray that you would give us a holy compulsion, a holy desire, a love that is deep enough and broad enough and and a love that is strong enough that we would love them so much that we would want them to not miss out on having this wonderful experience of having supper with Jesus. So I pray that you would give us the courage and the wisdom and the strength as we go from this place to go as the light. You called us. You didn't call us just so we can come and enjoy one another as great as that is that's a blessing you did call us to do that you didn't just call us to come here and just feed here you called us to go out into the highways and byways when you when we look and we see that there are tables and chairs yet empty we go to the highways and bow byways and we compel them to come in help us to do that in obedience to jesus motivated by love for him and by our love for the people that we know that are not yet ready to come to this supper. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity. We look forward to that great and glorious day in which we'll be seated around the throne with you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.